I'm Pastor Stephen, and it is from Dry Bones to Living Warriors. That's the session. Free pens and free journals. What a good life. Did you read what was on the front of that journal? Did you see what it says? I heard someone say that once, and it really impacted me. We were at a conference, and uh, he said, hey, if you don't write it down, you can write it off. I thought, that's good. I hope that this week, as you are just in these classes, but also the beautiful evenings, who was here last night? Wasn't that a beautiful evening? Just in the presence of the Lord, he speaks to us, and if we are listening and in the right posture, and we're leaning into his voice, and we record what he has told us, we won't forget it. We forget what we ate like three hours ago. We forget what we said to the person 30 minutes ago. So when we write these things down, we can look back and remember what the Lord has done. And sometimes the word is just as fresh as it was. And even other times it's even more refreshing because you read it in a timely moment. So I just pray that throughout this whole week, as you've been journaling and writing, as we've all been doing that together, God's gonna speak things into our life that we may see the immediate fruit of, or one day we'll see the harvest of. But when it's his words to our heart, we gotta write it down. So can we pray? And then we're gonna jump right into a portion of the book of Ezekiel. God, I thank you so much that we can gather together, that we can be a family, Lord, and we can turn our eyes towards you, our Father, and as we turn our eyes towards you, you transform our heart, our very being. We get to be children who talk about who our Father is and what you have for us. So our prayer right now, Lord, is that our hearts would be open and our minds would be available for you to speak to us and transform us. It's all about you, God. Do something new in us, something fresh in us. In this moment today, that we might see the world around us and the lives we encounter change tomorrow. We say all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. So the main text we're gonna be reading from is Ezekiel 37, and we're gonna be going through verses one through 14. So if you have your Bible or a device that you can access the Bible on, you can turn to that because we're gonna be reading through this passage and this portion twice. But before we do, I wanna give a little bit of the background. Who likes context and culture to understand the story, right? Because we're just about to jump into a valley with dry bones and it can get real weird real quick. But if we understand the context and what's actually happening, I think we'll realize how relevant it is for us even here and now. And this word and really the title and the story hit my heart uh, when we were asked to speak at these sessions a few months ago. And I've always loved this story, but even now reflecting on it in the current events that we're in, it became so much more relevant, refreshing, and convicting to hear this story in this day in this time. We're in the midst of a world right now surrounded by death, hopelessness, fear. And sometimes you wake up, and I don't know if you feel the same thing I feel, but you can just feel the weight spiritually that this is like, it feels like a wasteland. And I'm not just talking about how there's less people in cities and less people taking walks and all that. But I'm saying even in the spiritual realm, it feels like a wasteland. And guess who else can feel that way? Us, the people of God. You know, we live in the world. Though we are not of it, nor called to be citizens of it because we're citizens of the kingdom of God, yet we are called to be in the world, which means it's near us, it's around us. We feel the weight, we discern the times and the spirit of those times. And so we can find ourselves also battling in the same heart and heartache of feeling a little hopeless, discouraged, exhausted, Struggling like dusty bones, lacking hope. I know in this season, many of us have asked harder questions than maybe we have in the past. 
Maybe you stood in the gap for somebody who you were praying they would be healed and they weren't. Maybe you lost your job or you saw your kids work so hard to get their degrees and go to school and they had to make a hard decision and now they're not able to do that. All these things make us ask hard questions. God, what are you doing? God, where are you? Like David in the Psalms, crying out with lament. And I find that we are in that place. And now as we discuss it and we address it, there is hope. But we have to be real with what we're in the midst of in order for us to see the real presence and power of God come forth out of that place. There was a real grave and a real death of Jesus, which then made it a real resurrection and true eternal life. And so I think sometimes we skirt around um, being authentic to the reality that surrounds us. But many times if we realize it, and then we turn our eyes and hearts in the right direction, we'll see something powerful happen. And there is an army he is wanting to rise up in the midst of a valley of dry bones. And it's not just bodies, it's living and breathing beings touched by the master's hand. So you've got Ezekiel, he's a prophet. A little background about him is that he's not really called into being a prophet until he's in exile, which is interesting. Now he's in the Babylonian exile. Ezekiel's a married man, has a family, and uh, he was of a priestly line, but he was really called into being a prophet in this moment. And it's interesting, you know, when we read the scripture, we don't always associate the time periods, but Daniel, even though he would have been younger than Ezekiel, he was a contemporary, and so was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem, but Ezekiel and Daniel were in Babylon. And Daniel was in the house of the kings and the educated, but Ezekiel was with those who were the captives, the people, the Jews who were taken captive. This is his surrounding. This is what's happening in the midst of his life. Now, he actually has a pretty good life and a pretty easy life, even in captivity. But we know when God takes hold of him and he's called to be the prophet that God destined him to be, uh, he didn't always give easy messages. So Ezekiel wasn't the guy all the time that came into the room and everyone liked seeing him, right? He wasn't the one who's like, oh, good, he's got good news for us. Sometimes it was hard news. Sometimes it was good news. What made Ezekiel special was that he was always ready to be the mouthpiece of God. And he was speaking to a people held in captivity. And this word specifically in chapter 37 is coming after 10 years that the people of God have been in exile, held as captives. This is the context. And Ezekiel is now promising these people that there will be one day a restoration. One day, they'll have their land back. There'll be new leadership. There'll be a better life. One day. Not right away, but one day. See, the Jewish people were in captivity, like we said, and they were in the midst of a people group, the Babylonians, who didn't understand who Yahweh was. And being in that context and that culture for a year, two years, three years, 10 years, and we know for decades and decades later, they were beginning to forget who Yahweh was. They were growing dry and brittle discouraged, fragile, literally struggling to live, food, all these basic necessities to where even when you would look at the people, many of them might look like skin and bones because of the suffering being held captive in a foreign land. And they began to forget who their God was. You know, I have, I have found that as you study the history of the church and the people of God, Many times, it is when it gets darkest and most difficult that there's a big wave of discouragement that hits the people of God. And then God raises up those who will be his mouthpiece to stir the hearts and souls of people again, and specifically the children, the sons and daughters of God, to look and say, where does your hope come from? 
Where does your help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. All of a sudden, God does this through history where he begins to take the hearts of those who are ready and willing to hear him to stir in the people who are discouraged and hopeless that there is one who can redeem and restore them. And this is who Ezekiel is. Now, when we jump into chapter 37, which we're gonna read, you're gonna see that there is, uh, there's many different perspectives on this. Did he actually go to a real place and see a real valley with bones? Was this a vision that he had? And, and there's arguments and discussions uh, on both sides of that. But what we do know for a fact is this is from God for the people at the right time and Ezekiel is really experiencing this moment with Almighty God. Chapter 37, verse one. I'm gonna read through all of this to 14, and then we're gonna break it into three sections. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and placed me in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. He made me walk around among them. And I realized there were a great many bones in the valley and they were very dry. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said to him, sovereign Lord, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and tell them, dry bones, listen to the Lord's message. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. Look, I am about to infuse breath into you and you will live. I will put tendons on you and muscles over you and will cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, Ezekiel speaking. There was a sound. When I prophesied, I heard a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. As I watched, I saw tendons on them. Then muscles appeared and skin covered over them from above, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these corpses so that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and the breath came into them. They lived and stood on their feet, an extremely great army. Then he said to me, son of man. Now realize, when he says son of man, sometimes we say, well, Jesus was considered and called the son of man. And now in this context, and you'll see this throughout the Old Testament, Ezekiel is actually called son of man many times. What God is emphasizing here is who he is, his perspective, he's infinite, and then who we are, finite in our limited perspective. It's just making a distinguished uh, picture of God and humanity. We're not on the same level. There's a different perspective, different beings. And so that's what's happening in this text. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are all the house of Israel. Look, they are saying our bones are dry. Our hope has perished. We're cut off. Remember, they're far away. They're removed. They're, they're, they're gone from Jerusalem, the place they grew up, a place of faith and hope. Remember, they would turn to the place of God, to the temple of the Lord, and they would say things like, I lift my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He'll watch over me. So there's this disconnect. Aren't we in a time where we have seen where the people of God have even had to disconnect from one another, even in close community and rhythm because of what we've just recently walked through? And at times, these discouraging moments that we could even share in the narrative of the people of Israel where they say, we're cut off. Therefore, prophesy and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am about to open your graves and will raise you from your graves, my people. I will bring you to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from the graves, my people. I will place my breath in you and you will live. I will give you rest in your own land and then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will act, declares the Lord. I love that. 
I have spoken and I will act. God is not one who just gives us empty promises or just says many words to say them. He's saying something because he's about to do something. So let's break this down. Whenever we do studies like this through the word of God or a passage, I find it's helpful when we break things down. And so we're gonna break it into three portions of scripture. And the first is verses one through six. When God grabs you, get ready. The beginning says, the hand of the Lord was on me. Some, some translations will say, the Lord gripped me, the Lord took me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord. If we are willing and ready, we have a heart that is willing, then the spirit of the Lord will lead us. He will lead us. See, Ezekiel had decided to follow God and be his mouthpiece, no matter the message. Ezekiel was not one who was afraid of what man would think or man would say because he had a greater fear and reverence for God Almighty, and he knew what he was called to do. You could say he was owned by God, a slave to God and not to man. Isn't it interesting that they are captives in a foreign land under the power of Babylon? And yet Ezekiel knows, you don't own me. He's still functioning as a prophet, declaring what the Lord will do how the Lord will heal, how the Lord will restore to a people who sometimes did not want to listen to him or didn't like what he would have to say to them, but he knew who he was owned by. And people of God, we have to know who we're owned by. When the apostle Paul says, I'm a slave to Christ, there's an ownership. We will either be owned by self or by others, or by God. And so Ezekiel, though a captive by the circumstances that surrounded him, he knows who owns him. His eyes were on God, and because his eyes were on God, his heart was with God, and his affections followed. See, I think many times in our life, we struggle with our affections towards God because our eyes have left him. What you look at will draw your affections. It's just reality. It's actually science. When we speak of the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and all those elements within humanity, there's something sacred and holy about our eyes. The eyes are the windows of the soul. And so Ezekiel has his eyes on God, even in the midst of difficult circumstance, even when he's in the midst of a people who have lost hope, who are buried under pain and oppression, fear, sickness. He has his eyes still on the Lord. And because his eyes are on the Lord, his affections are drawn to God, which means he was a man whose heart was owned by God. And where does God take him? To a dry valley with bones. He takes him to a cemetery. God you know, you're hoping like he takes him to the throne room of grace and he sees the new temple. Not yet, Ezekiel. He'll see that later. But he takes him to a place that's uncomfortable. He takes him to a place that would feel inconvenient. He's in the midst of death, bones. Uh, so just... The other night we were eating ribs, okay, and Emerson, who is our four-year-old, she, uh, she just, she's so sweet and she loves eating and getting messy, right? So she's just eating and all this stuff. So she's like, what are these? And I said, these are like, these are, they're, they're ribs, they're like bones. And she says, oh, okay, okay. So she continues eating and I'm like, oh good, we skirted around like, how did they get here? <laughs> Well, <laughs> all those hard decisions. 
as a parent. And so, so I'm like, oh, that's fine, so eat. So the next day in the playground, Anna told me that this little boy on the playground comes up to Anna and says, I hear that you eat cow bones. And Anna's like, this is a weird conversation to have with a four-year-old. <laughs> and she said, I'm, I, what, what? And then you just hear Emerson in the background, I told him we eat cow bones and all animal bones. And Anna's like, oh, we ate ribs to the parent who was there. Like, we eat ribs, we don't eat. And it sounded just so dark and strange. And so we had a conversation with Emerson later, like, well, there's bones that you, those are, just eat the ribs we tell you to eat. <laughs> but, but here's the reality right? It was, it's uncomfortable when Anna heard that. Now just think of the discomfort that Ezekiel is experiencing in this moment when he looks around and he sees these dusty bones and the story of this. He's beginning to correspond as God reveals to him the connection between the people he is called to lead prophetically and where they're at. Hopelessness, fields of pain, Valley of dry bones. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. I think we're in a season where the people of God and our world are in fields of pain and discouragement. But there was one willing in this time and his name was Ezekiel. And he was in the right place and the right posture. He was in the right place and he was in the right posture to then hear God, listen to the Lord, and even have a conversation with God. And we read about that. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? God was asking him a question, talking and conversing with him. Listen, there are ways for us as the people of God to step into what is the prophetic life there are ways for us to live a life of sacred rhythms and habits that posture us in the right way so we can hear the Lord. I think sometimes we may just ponder and say, oh, I, I guess I have to do something really super wild, crazy, or spiritual and we are a Pentecostal church here, and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit and the life of the Spirit. But sometimes we superimpose our own idea of what that looks like. And what we don't realize is when you read throughout Scripture, you see the people of God who are used by the Spirit of God were constantly posturing themselves in the right way and in the right places, habitually, habitually. And there were sacred rhythms in their life. In the chronological element of their life, there were these sacred rhythms, and then all of a sudden, in the midst of that place and that time, a kairos moment hits where heaven and earth collide. You know what a great example is? If you jump ahead and you see Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna, Simeon the one who holds baby Jesus 40 days after Jesus was born, there near the temple, and Anna, who's there with him, and prophesies and declares. There's this beautiful moment where he holds Jesus. My eyes have seen the salvation. Now I can die. Now, I love that story. But there was a lot of decades, a lot of decades, where Simeon and Anna showed up at the temple looking Seeking, waiting, chronologically, year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month, the same place with the same heart posture. And then one day he sees salvation. I know that's not always the most encouraging story because we like things immediate. But God works in process as well. Oftentimes, he works in process and steps. It was their sacred rhythms that made them have the right posture. We need to posture ourselves towards seeking and discerning God. And Ezekiel was in that right place with that right posture. And he heard God. And he conversed with God. 
See, if we do those things, then you'll be invited into the workings and the movements of God. And that's the prophetic life. The prophetic life is being invited into the movements and the workings of God. It is not carrying on your own the movements and the workings of God. The prophet does not say, Ooh, I gotta stir the pot and make this happen and then pour it out on everybody. No, he's postured, she's postured in the right way to hear and to see and to receive and to be surrendered to who God is and what he's doing and then participate with it. And this is the prophetic life. And in this next moment, when he begins to see what God's doing to these bones, there's a reality of God as creator and his attention to detail. You know, in a moment, they could have been alive, but he's seeing the process unfold. He's seeing how God is the designer and the former of these bodies from these dusty bones. And it also makes us peer back at the beginning of humanity, where God forms out of the dust man. He forms him. And then what happens? He breathes into him. It's also a foreshadowing of what will come, that one day there would be a body of believers, the body of Christ, surrounded, connected, and held together by the workings of Jesus Christ and his grace, his power, and his resurrection. But Jesus would say, I need to leave so that one can come. The spirit, the ruah, the pneuma, the breath, the wind, the life. So I love when we read through scripture and we find ourselves peering back at the story of where it began and we also see where God is taking his people. And there's Ezekiel found in that place. And when we go on to verse seven, we're gonna go from seven through verse 10. We're gonna read that and I'm gonna read it quickly. So I prophesied as I was commanded and there was a sound when I prophesied. I heard a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. As I watched, I saw tendons on them. The muscles appeared and skin covered over them from above, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these corpses so that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and the breath came into them. They lived and stood on their feet, an extremely great army. Now, the difference of this is that Ezekiel sees and hears what God wants him to do and is going to do, but then he has to speak it. He has to say it. He was speaking out of something. He was speaking out of that place of being present before the Lord, if we're following through the text, and the right posture, and the right heart, and the right affections, and the right place, right? All this is lining up. And he's speaking out of that place of the presence of God. Here's the thing. My father-in-law, uh, always says this, and I just, I just find it so good because he, he lives that way. He'll say to me, his name is David. He's a pastor in Colorado. He says, some people say something and others have something to say. And you might have heard that statement before, right? Some people say something and others have something to say. And oftentimes with that, we all know, I, Long Island, uh, we, we're, we're, we're a chit-chatty group, right? We, we, we like to talk a lot. And when I went out to Oklahoma, I remember I was like in awe of the silence. People are really contemplative here. We're like, I don't get uncomfortable with that. I gotta talk about something. He was speaking out of something, Ezekiel. And it was different than just saying something. And, and, and that's the difference, people of God, of the prophetic life and just a real talkative life. We've all been around those that when they say something, it hits because it's out of something else. Empty words we have to be aware of and careful of. Weighty words 
come with a struggle, but they also come with fruit and harvest. We have to maintain the tension of holding our earthly selves in a divine check. We have to. It's easy for you and I to muddy God's message to his people and to the world around us with our personal preferences, internal dialogue, and what we think is best. Let's be honest. It's really easy to do that. We have to hold ourselves in this sacred divine check and tension not to do that. To be a people living the prophetic life means we are sober, we hold to the sacredness of what that means, we have a heavy responsibility, and it requires our words and steps to line up with only his leading. Only his leading. So here, first bodies come together and then second breath fills them up. You know, there are a lot of people who come to church or gather in communities and have no breath in them still. The body of Christ is just a carcass without the breath and the spirit in it. Yes, it goes hand in hand. The spirit is vital. It's not just an add-on. Unfortunately, throughout the history of the church, it has sometimes been treated just as an add-on, but it's not. It's vital to who we are called to be. We can preach and declare. We can speak to people's lives and we can preach and declare and it can rattle them, but its effects are still limited unless the spirit is in it. We've all heard a message from God that has rattled our life and shook our life. We all can say that. We've heard, it shook me up. But you know also the next moments when the Holy Spirit invaded your life, hit your life, something came alive. And it is hand in hand. But even when you study the context of this, you'll realize that Ezekiel is used to the setting of what's happening. As a prophet, he is used to speaking to lifeless people the words of God. And afterwards, they still walk away lifeless. But God is revealing to Ezekiel something different, even in his whole ministry, and what he's about to do to the people of God both then and further in the future all the way to us, he's revealing that it's not just a rattling and a shaking in words upon man written on stone, but it would be something written on the hearts of humanity, something inside of us. And so he's revealing to him the vitality of what it means for the spirit of God to get inside of humanity. There's this big shift in the dialogue between Ezekiel and God in this moment of Ezekiel's whole call in life. We have to realize, people of God, the season we are in and the setting we are in and the people we are among and the world that we walk through every day, just the right words, yes, it can shake people up, but without the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, penetrating lives, we will not see the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Words are good, but when it comes to the soul and spirit of humanity, it needs breath. And Genesis reveals that to us. He breathed. He formed with his hands. He did. He formed with his hands, shook up the dust and the dirt, and made humanity. But then he breathed into us. There's one moment in there, the four winds, and really what that stands for is, you know, the four corners of the earth. This is what it's saying. Any work of revival is God's work from start to finish, not man's. The work of revival in the world, God started it. The whole encompassing dynamic of the world and who we are is all because of him and what he's done. And once they're filled with life, what happens? They stand up. The theme of this whole week of prayer is that we would kneel to stand. And I, I feel that the Holy Spirit is convicting us all 
that the posture we take on our knees is making us open to what the Spirit is doing and how he's leading us. And in that place, he wants to fill us in a new way that then allows us to stand. For the army was formed and they were bodies, but they were still just carcasses until the Spirit filled them. Then they stood up. Then they stood up. You know, the last part is verses 11 through 14. And it's really for us allowing you and I to realize who are we in the story while also revealing to us the story of Israel and what God would do. What is God saying to you and what is he saying to me? And we're gonna read through this quickly and then we'll close. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are all the house of Israel. Look, they are saying our bones are dry. Our hope has perished. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am about to open up your graves and will raise you from your graves, my people. I will bring you to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. My people, my people. I will place my breath in you and you will live. I will give you rest in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will act, declares the Lord. And this just in closing for us. We have to find who we are in this story. And what I mean by that is wherever you're at, in the midst of your current relationship and posture with God. And it's okay to be either one who God is calling to a new depth of a prophetic life, or you're just one of the bones who feels dried up in the valley. Both are platforms and catalysts for the work of the holy and the sacred. The prophetic life is what I wanna hit right now in this moment. I believe that some of us are here and God is calling you to a new level of living out a prophetic life. You're called to walk into the valleys and plains of dried up and hopeless people. And you're given this privilege because he trusts you. So we must then stay in a posture of surrender. And the best posture of surrender is what? Kneeling, right? This is what happens. This is what a surrendered life looks like. And Jesus shows us that example when he kneels down and he prays to his heavenly father when he kneels down and washes his disciples' feet. A posture of surrender, constantly kneeling on our knees. You read about the ancient prophets and you can read about them and what they've done and who they were. And many times you'll find that each of them are always, there's a reference somewhere about them kneeling or laying prostrate before the Lord or even in a fetal position. There's a surrender The prophetic life starts with a surrendered life always, and it stays in a surrendered life always. The prophet doesn't walk around with their chest out and their head up high because they know who is the most high, and they made him their dwelling place. A surrendered life. Get ready to see his spirit be released out of you because you're allowing his spirit to lead you. See, God is already working in the world with or without us. Quickly, when I was in Africa, and it's a story I always tell and I have to keep telling it because it's an amazing one. But when I was in Africa, and we were in a village where we were building a church and they had not known the gospel of Jesus. It was an unreached people group. And we were in there and we were building. There was a witch doctor who hated us and he felt something around us, it was the spirit of the Lord. And one night while we were sleeping, we were sleeping, we were sleeping, we weren't praying, we weren't crying out, we weren't doing something really spiritual like a 24 hour prayer meeting. We were exhausted from making mud bricks and building a church there and so we were resting and sleeping. And this witch doctor came and he tried to put a curse on us, to kill us, to make us sick, to make us leave. And the next morning we woke up, he was there and he was conversing with one of the African pastors who were with us there in that place. And he kept saying to them, what power do you have? And they kept saying, 
why are you asking? He said, what power do you have? If you've ever watched an African pastor talk about the power of God, you're gonna get saved all over again because it was this moment we're just watching with a translator next to us telling us. And as he says, why? He says, because I came here last night to kill all of you, to put a curse on you. He said, but whatever power you have is greater than mine and I couldn't do a thing. What power do you have? And suddenly the whole story continues. That witch doctor gets saved. He finds Jesus. He's one of the first members of the church. And years later, team comes back and they discover that that witch doctor had just died. But before he died, guess what he did? He went around to the surrounding villages and brought other witch doctors to Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Only the power of Holy Spirit. Guess what we were doing? We were sleeping because the spirit of the Lord is working and moving and he wants us a part of his movement and his workings, but we are not the catalyst of them. And the prophetic life realizes that he is already working, so I need to make sure I am surrendered and lined up to follow his lead. And when I follow his lead, sometimes he will say, show up, and sometimes he will say, speak out. But I wait for his lead. This is the prophetic life. My prayer is that some of you, as you say yes to this next place God wants to take you, that you will prophesy the breath of God, not your own breath. You will prophesy the spirit of God, not your own spirit over your loved ones and your spouse, your children, your friends, coworkers, student, people group. I feel though specifically in this room, in my heart, that somebody, your spouse, you've just felt like there's no hope. They're so dead and even their faith is dead. And the Lord wants you to hear this so you can speak out his breath and his life over them. And you will see dry bones come back into living warriors, not because of what you did, but who he is and what he has done through you. This is the prophetic life. Continuing to live out the life of faith, hear this, without seeing the promises fulfilled. Continuing to live out the life of faith without seeing the promises fulfilled. This is the invitation to a prophetic life. Most every prophet who declared what would happen did not live to see it. Ezekiel did not live to see the fulfillment of this prophecy, but he dedicated and surrendered his life to it. That's why we hold the invitation to a prophetic life with such a weight and sobriety and yet such a beauty that it's so much bigger than us, that we are a beautiful stroke of paint in the work of art and the story of God, of the human condition and his saving grace. And we play a vital role as that stroke and as that letter. We do, but we're not the end all. And the prophetic life is a life surrendered to declare the things that you might see with your mind's eye or with your heart. You may never be able to touch and feel and hold, but you know one day, one day, that's hope. That's hope. And that who God is calling us to be, that's who he's calling you and I to be. And that's a weightiness. You have to think about that before you jump into it. And some of us who find ourselves as dry bones, just a bone in the pile, the burial ground of our dying faith. And that's where we find ourselves. The Holy Spirit is moving and he might move through someone else in your life. This is what community is. We reach to each other and we speak life to one another. The life of the Spirit, the unity of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate, he's our helper. He's the advocate comes beside us and we are called to be a community and a people with the spirit of unity through the power of the Holy Spirit to help one another, to pull each other up. Now more than ever, we need one another. Now more than ever, we need the strength of community founded upon who Christ is through the breath and life of the spirit. Otherwise, it's just a club. It's just a club and not the living, breathing warriors of the church if we don't have the spirit and we just gather. 
But if we just have the spirit and we don't gather, then we're just an individual agent walking around doing our own thing. It has to be both and connected. And maybe some of us feel like you are a dry bone. This is what I encourage you with. In the kingdom of God, if you're not actively moving or actively waiting, then you are spiritually dying. If you're not actively moving or you're not actively waiting, it sounds ironic and paradoxical, and that's exactly what it is, then you're spiritually dying. Don't find solace in just being a dried up bone. And maybe some of you have believed this lie. You know what? I think I've done what I need to do. Now I'm, I'm ready to just go home. Can I encourage you to hold on to the truth and the faith that God wants to call you maybe into the best season of your life in honoring him and living for him? And don't fall into the world's game or the spirit of our culture right now and the evil and darkness of the cloud that is trying to come over even the church and the people of God to make us escape and to make us run away and to make us just to wait till we die for then one day his glory. For his glory wants to invade the world here and now. Just as much now, if not even more. For the glory of the Lord will grow and the light will be brighter and brighter brighter and brighter as the bridegroom is coming back for his church. Do you understand what I'm saying? The bridegroom is coming back for his church, which means it's brighter and brighter. Yes, darkness gets real, but the light only shines brighter. People of God, if we can live a life not to be stuck in the valley of dry bones and give up, but turn our eyes to heaven and look for the light in the midst of the darkness, we will become the light of the world where there will be no darkness and we will be ones who are living warriors. The wind is coming, the faithful are seeking, the humble are willing, the desperate are surrendered, and the world is shaking. He's raising an army, formed by him, filled with him, who fight beside him. Our world needs a living and breathing people of God who are willing to go where no one else will go, who are willing to have the posture that no one else will have. And if we do that, we will see his kingdom come we will see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven and we will see the greatest harvest that the world has ever seen because the bridegroom is coming. But may he not find us in the banquet hall just partying with those who are a part of the club. And may he not find us hiding in the cellar till he would come back, but may he find us in the fields, in the harvest, toiling where he already is waiting for him to return that we might give him plenty and not little. People of God, live the prophetic life. It's waiting for you whether you're a dry bone or you're someone who's just standing on the sidelines like Ezekiel was when God called him. It's waiting for us. Lord, would you fill us? Would you help us and would you strengthen us? May we be your people doing your will May we be your people doing your will. May we surrender that we might stand up a living army who declare the glory and the workings and the miracles of our God and we bring the lost with us that they might become sons and daughters. Let SGT be a place where our banquet table is full of those that we have reached out to and found that we have called out of that valley and that plain of dry bones. And they are now living warriors with us. We love you, God. We say all this in Jesus' name, amen and amen.